This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 302, recorded on September 12th, 2014. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. I feel like I haven't done this in a while. It's It's been at least two weeks because... It's been on hiatus. Last week was a pre-recorded. Then the week before was 300. Yes, it was. And I think the week before that was 299, which was another pre-recorded. Right. Yeah, so it's been since August 17th, almost a month. That's true. That's why it felt a bit odd, you know. Yeah, well, we're back in the swing of things. Dixon, beautiful day today. It's fabulous out there. It is gorgeous. Yep. There's a blue sky with just wispy clouds. Yep. And it's really fall weather, isn't it? It's true. 20, Low humidity. 24 nice degrees Celsius, 47% humidity. And the Hudson River has been very interesting today. It no? has. We had foam lines. We had foam and, and big ships. Let's bring the others in so they can hear, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> also joining us from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rich. Hello, How you Rich? doing? We're all well. We, we are got, well. We got uh, 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 32.8 C. Right. And um, uh, typical... Uh, puffy Florida clouds. Mm. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's not cool, but it's nice. Fifty-one degree, fifty-one percent humidity. That's we're it's not so bad. It, we, it, yeah. We got a touch of uh, sort of. We're getting out of summer. Everybody's yeah, we real are. excited we about are. that. Yeah, we that's are. Right. That's right. So. It's too bad. It's too bad. Yep. Uh, th- that we're feeling differently about that here. Also <laughs> joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How's the weather out there? Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, just the very, very beginning of autumn, 74 Fahrenheit, 23C. Um, nice. Clear blue skies. And, and I, autumn around here is great because it starts to get gorgeous. Yeah. The leaves change and it's really pretty. And finally, last but not least, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Okay. What is Ann Arbor again Hi, in, in Michigan, North Central, Western? No, it's Southeastern. Right. Uh, I forgot to write it in the show notes and I couldn't remember. <laughs> Southeastern. Yeah. Uh, you must have similar weather out there, right? Uh, 61, <clears throat> oh. uh, which is 14 Celsius. Or no, 58, sorry. And 14 Celsius and uh, clouds, but some of them have grayish bottoms. It's supposed to rain tonight. But there's some blue sky, too. Wow, rain. 58 sounds really cold. Crisp. It's crisp. We call that crisp. Crisp. As yeah. Ronald Reagan would say, good sleeping weather, right? Yeah. <laughs> Football game weather. <laughs> that's what Ronald Reagan did all the... Oh, I'm sorry. Did a lot of sleeping. No, <laughs> my, my favorite Ronald Reagan quote was when he... Uh, when he would... People would talk to him about how fit he was. He would say that his exercise was pumping firewood. <laughs> pumping? Time, yeah, he spent time out at his... Uh, Ch- on his chopping ranch. it up, you mean? Pot chopping it up, carrying it, all that kind of wow. stuff. Pumping firewood. All right. Well, I could see that. Hmm. I don't know. Do you think you sleep better when it's cooler out? Well, maybe maybe the movie Bedtime for Bonzo sort of convinced him that hmm. it is good time to go sleep. Let's go to sleep. <laughs> Bonzo sleeps. I sleep. This is our first uh, episode together after three hundred. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. It's now that nice. we're totally familiar with each other, we're all we're all back for this three hundred two. We are. And so it's kind of cool. I, I, yeah. I like doing them, you know, live and all that stuff. Yeah. So we'll be we'll have a bunch in a row now that are recorded on Fridays. Yeah, except that I'm not going to be around. Yeah, it's too bad, Rich. Hmm. Yeah, for a long well, time. Yeah, like it's like, like it six weeks. Six right? weeks. Really? Unless you and I get together in bummer. Bummer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's that? Bummer. Bummer. Oh, Bummer. 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 You go to. Oh, you're going to study Balmer. section. Right. That's right. We talked uh, about. It. Oh, yeah, I forgot it. I got to see if we can you arrange it. You forgot something. about it. What's, okay. the, what's the date on that? Uh, uh, October 16, 17. Right. <laughs> exact. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Dixon, you want to go to Baltimore? No, I'll be in Vienna. 
Dixon, you want to go to Baltimore and meet Rich and do a podcast? I said, no, I'll be in Vienna. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, why didn't I just say, ask you at all? You know. At any rate, if we don't do that, I'm out of here for six weeks. Sorry, dude. It's Twiv's fault anyway. Why is that? Because the only reason anybody ever invites me anywhere to do anything is because of Twiv. <laughs> hey, me too. Otherwise, I'd be here the whole time. Me too. I'm not complaining. I'm going to Georgia no, on Sunday to, Georgia, do, to do Georgia. You're going to Georgia. All right. We're in Georgia. <clears throat> uh, Athens. Excellent. Is that where you Good. were? Yeah. University of Georgia? Jones. Yeah. I'm in the I'm going to the vet school, the Division mm-hmm. of Infectious Diseases. Mm-hmm. Um and I have Biao Hay as one of my guests and mm-hmm. another guy whose name escapes me, but is a veterinary virologist. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm gonna do a seminar and a podcast. And they promised the students promised to take me out um to see music. Mm-hmm. Nice. Because cool. I understand they have good music there. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they have a fabulous ecology group. The music won't start probably till about 1130 at night. No, no, I can't do that. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah, that, no. th- in that case, I'm not going. I mean, oh. in Austin, it was already we, rocking at 930, right, Rich? Uh, it, 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 Yeah, but even that was late for me. Yeah, we got out of there at 1 a.m., right? Uh, well, you did. I left. You uh, went home. I went home, yeah. Yeah, Sullivan was pretty impressed. Uh, it was uh, uh, that was a great group, but I was, was drinking fun. seltzer, you know. <laughs> well, that'll keep you up all night. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run to the bathroom. All right, we have some follow up. First one is from a guy named VRR. That's me. I just had a follow up with Kathy, who said in in number three hundred. I think she was asked, you know, how are women doing in science, right? Something mm-hmm. like that. And you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're doing okay. We can do better as long as we get buy-in from men. I just want to remind everyone of Jay, J, Joe Handelsman's study, which we talked about on TWIM48, which shows basically that both men and women and women display gender bias. You know, so it's, I know there are lots of departments where they're all men, unfortunately, and you've got to get past them. But it, it, even in divided departments, uh, both men and women have to buy in, right? Right. And I think what I said was something more along the lines of things are moving faster now that we're also getting buy-in from men. But, you know, there are a lot of Mm. studies that show that when there's bias, both men and women have it. So we all have these unconscious biases that we have to work to get around. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I I found an article on ABC News, which relates to... Uh, TWIV 298, where we talked about M. venus de Milo, also right. known as curing multiple myeloma with a modified measles virus. And here on ABC News is the uh, the woman who's... Uh, no wait, Andy. shut this off. Uh, autoplay video. Ah. Ah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I can't turn it off. But you can turn down the sound. Yeah, they don't let you turn it off because it's running an ad. Yeah, it's Natch. Can't That's do. right. And it's Jack Mac, uh, just Mac and Rose. Um, I saw enough of that on the open. <laughs> I have to just say that the woman who was cu- was cured, okay, for multiple myeloma, which we talked about in that podcast, it's an article about her, and uh, it's it gives her name, and it shows her a photo of her with her family and how she's like, she's going to raise money to... Uh, do more, do more research. So it's pretty cool. Hmm. I mm-hmm. think that's a neat yeah, follow-up. Yeah, and apparently they're expanding those trials. Yeah. So she survived, had no more tumor, and um, we talked about it, and now she's in the news. So she got the TWIV bump, right? Yeah. She got the Venus de Milo bump. <laughs> okay, now a few letters. First one's from Marion, who writes, Two virological comments regarding the listener who worried about the possibility of Ebola virus spreading within the U.S. I agree, as Tom Frieden does. The likelihood of human-to-human spread is low because of our great healthcare system. However, since Ebola is zoonotic, I want to speculate why why it also seems unlikely that Ebola virus would spread to U.S. non-human animal hosts, perhaps bats, and become a reservoir here. Many viruses are found in American bats, but I believe no Ebola virus. Successful zoonotic viruses do not usually kill their non-human animal hosts, presumably because they have co-evolved with their host an introduction of Ebola virus into Western Hemisphere non-human animals is more likely to be catastrophic to the animal and not lead to establishment of a new animal reservoir. For the same reason that it is catastrophic in humans, it is not yet adapted. My second comment is related to a comment that Frieden made at his press conference. It is a subtle virological point, 
that may have been lost in the frenzy. Parenthetically, you might want to mention this, this new paper that's out, which we'll get to in a moment, <clears throat> which delineates mutations in the outbreak strains. Uh, we know this outbreak is more devastating because it is in a highly populated region, thus affecting more people. However, high levels of replication will permit more mutations to accumulate. This is discussed in the paper. Although it is not known yet whether this new strain is more pathogenic, it may be that simply by occurring in a more densely populated region, unfortunately, evolution of a more transmissible or more virulent strain may occur. <clears throat> so I, the first point is good about the uh, bats and, and adaptation. A second point, so the uh, uh, Marion refers to a science paper just recently published which sequences... Uh, a number of the strains from the current outbreak, I think 70 plus uh, or so strains, Sev 99 genomes from 78 patients in Sierra Leone, and um, they find hundreds of changes in these genomes. And um, No surprise. No surprise. You don't know what any of them mean, of course. And they say, well, we're putting this sequence out here so people can work on this. And... Um, that, of course, will require some BSL-4 laboratories. Okay. Of course. Yep. Uh, they also do, do we have any of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a bunch, and one of them is not yet open, right? Right. Um, and they basically say it looks like it started with one hum animal-to-human trans uh, transmission, and it's all, it's all derived from that, which we kind of suspected before. It's a cool mm. paper, um, and I think there'll be a lot of work based on it. But, you know, a lot of people have noted and we'll talk about it later this idea it's, it's going through a lot of people so it's mutating a lot well you know what it doesn't matter how much it mutates the, the, the point is whether you make a virus that's viable to do anything yep. and um, you know getting transmissibility by aerosol or more virulence is who knows if that's going to happen so you know why why become more virulent I can see why you might want to be aerosol well, transmissible, but if you can transmit other ways, like viruses that do not transmit by aerosol that are very successful, can we think of one? Hmm, how about HIV-1? <laughs> you don't need to become aerosol transmissible. So, yes, viruses do mutate, sometimes more than at other times, but you can't necessarily say they're going to acquire these characteristics. Yes, this Dixon. I was just going to ask the, the open-ended question. Do you know of any major viral infection of humans that actually mutated to change its route of transmission? I don't know of any. I don't yeah, either. Why. I've had, we just had an argument on Twitter about this, um, which is very frustrating because it, it hasn't happened with flu. Flu comes into people, boom, it's ready to transmit by aerosol. It doesn't change after a year or two. Yes. Exactly. Uh, that's one of the reasons it comes into people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Indeed. And, and so with every outbreak, there's always, is it going to become aerosol so Is yellow fever going to become aerosolized? So, Come on, it still needs a mosquito. It hasn't, hasn't yet. yet. You know, that's it could exactly happen, right. sure. And we know with H5N1 in the lab, you could do it in ferrets, but it hasn't happened in So people. I think we ought to do the gain-of-function experiment with Ebola. <laughs> And, uh, and see if we can make it aerosol transmissible. What do you, well, you think? go ahead and write that? <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting. It could be that in its natural host, Ebola is aerosol transmissible, right? Mm. We Who don't knows? know. We have no idea because we're not even sure the natural transmission no, cycle. Nothing about the natural history. That's right. You know, so, okay. Sorry. So I, I just, uh, right. you know, the, the fact that something has not happened, I understand, doesn't mean that it won't in the future. But if you want to speculate, and I've heard a lot of people ask, is it going to become aerosol transmissible? If you want to speculate, what we have to go on is what we know, right? Right. And it hasn't happened, so I think the likelihood is low, and it shouldn't really drive our discussion. And, and it, it's not just that it hasn't happened with Ebola in this outbreak. It hasn't happened with Ebola ever, and it hasn't happened to change route of transmission for any virus that we can think of. Right ever after it enters humans. I mean, it it started out with one game, and that's what it plays. Here, here. I, I think going to trans aerosol transmissibility, just like changing a host, is not easy. No. Right? Now, host switches we know happen. They're not all that frequent, but they do happen. But aerosol transmissibility, I feel, um, imposes changes that 
don't make the virus work in that host anymore. That's my my guess, and and yeah. I think we need to study this more. Don't you guys agree? Absolutely, with absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and so, we even know we even know from the experiments that have been done, like the so-called gain of function studies in ferrets, that there is quite likely a fitness cost or a change in pathogenesis when you make a transition like that. Yes. yes. And there almost has to be when you're dealing with a system like a virus. So you make a virus that's more transmissible in ferrets, and guess what? It doesn't kill them. You lose something else. Oh, you true. lose something. So you, you, yeah, you yeah. know, a door opens, a door closes. Yep. So um, back to uh, Marion's first paragraph about bringing a virus over here that is a zoonosis and whether how it would interact with a potential animal host in the U.S. I'm thinking about West Nile. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so what what was its normal reservoir in its uh, it came from Africa, right? Originally. Uh what was its normal reservoir there and what were its effects in that host? And here it it trashed a lot of different birds but mostly yeah. crows, right? That's right. That's right. And did it behave the same in them? What's what's the story yeah, I mean, there? Because that could be an example of of uh, the kind of thing that Marion's talking about. Well, I don't think. Well, the African birds are obviously uh, adapted, and they've been highly selected by that virus not to die from it anymore. Okay. Right? So, you and, but uh, how, how related to crows are they? Very unrelated. Okay. The and so the crows are not. The crows are not really a natural host, and it came in and just wiped them out. Right. But it still now there. Uh, it, it, it West Nile is now basically endemic in the U.S. Is that Absolutely. a fair statement? You bet. And it's uh, but it's not. It, it is. Is it adapted to a host, or are we looking at the other cycles way. of acute infection? It's the other way. It's the hosts being selected for resistance by the ones that lived. Okay, so we're we're doing we're doing the Fenner experiment in that's Australia right. yeah, again. Right. We're exactly right. uh, achieving a new equilibrium. Sure, okay. and the crows have made a big comeback over recent years as a result. Okay. So Good for the crows. People sample crows and they find West Nile in them. Yep, they're the reservoir now. Well, I wouldn't call that a reservoir. That's a natural host. All right, it is a host. bird mosquito driven system. Okay, other birds as well. Other birds as well. In fact, it's a very promiscuous virus when you compare it to lots of others. Now, the problem, though, for a virus that comes in in humans would be how do you get to any kind of a yeah. suitable reservoir host in the new country? That's right. Yeah, especially if you're brought in in a BSL-3 suit. Yes, if you're brought in in a BSL-3 <laughs> suit and checked into a quarantine facility, exactly. you will hopefully not have enough contact with a variety of bat species, which we're no. presuming to be the reservoir. No, and remember, the first Lhasa case in the United States was right where we are sitting, Vincent and I are sitting, and that certainly didn't spread to the nurses or to the doctors or to anybody else. It, it stayed put. We'll have more on this later today. Is there some more things? But uh, let's in, a, in, in about two hours, <laughs> two and, maybe two and a half. I thought this would be a six hour a six hour episode, <laughs> right? The uh, Twiv marathon. <laughs> Alan, can you take the next follow? -up? Sure. Continuing with the follow up. Um, this is from Christos. Who writes, congratulations on reaching the 300 TWIV episode milestone. I was listening to episode 298 yesterday. A listener was asking about the half-life of the ZMAP antibodies for Ebola. And you mentioned that antibodies have a relatively short half-life and don't usually stay in circulation for more than a few weeks. Human IgG1s have a half-life of about three weeks. However, I would like to point out that FC engineering is now used to change right. the interaction of antibodies with the neonatal FC receptor and greatly prolong antibodies in circulation, and cites a couple of publications on that. Also, antibody therapies against exogenous targets, like the Ebola glycoproteins, have an advantage over antibodies against endogenous targets, for example, tumor cell proteins, as there's no target-mediated clearance, which also leads to improved half-life profiles. I think these are important points, because without the requirement for repeat dosing, one can start thinking of utilizing monoclonal antibodies in FC engineering to use antibodies as vaccine alternatives. Hmm. Yeah, it's, the field has changed a lot. So right. the FC part is, a, for those uh, who are not into this, antibodies kind of a Y-shaped protein molecule with the, f with the antigen, the functional site on the tip of the uh, Y, and the, the FC part is the stem of the Y um, uh, that uh, carries out 
a lot of function depending on what cellular receptors it uh, interacts with. So they're talking about how you can tweak that and influence the half-life of the antibody. Interesting. It's pretty cool. Yep. We also had an email the last time. Yeah, I seem to recall which that. Which also made similar suggestions. So yep. uh, it's cool technology. Yep. All right. Kathy. Howard writes, thanks for doing your usually excellent podcasts. On this one, I thought the approach taken was incorrect. And he's referring to the Ebola one, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Too much of the time, you seem to be assuming that only rich Westerners behind secure borders with top flight hospitals and virologists, with many thousands of dollars per infected person payable by rich governments with national health services, were the appropriate subjects of the podcast. You did not adequately discuss how to stop the spread of Ebola virus in Africa, the second largest and second most populous continent, with more than one billion people. So I'd like to make a little aside here because I didn't think that our purpose was to try and figure out the way to stop the spread of Ebola virus in Africa. Because if the four or five of us could do that, um, yeah, we'd be doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We so I thought our purpose was to try and inform something about the virology and so forth of the virus. Okay. Uh, I think also, as long as you're stopped, I think we did pay significant attention to how the difference in the uh, infrastructure in Africa and the uh, richer Western countries make a big difference in how the uh, infection plays out and being a major mm -hmm. cause in the spread of Ebola now in Africa. And there's a cultural difference by the way we treat people who die versus the way... Uh, lots of uh, West African nations treat right. their dead too. So we don't, although I know that uh, <laughs> when someone is interred and the loved ones uh, get up to kneel down in front during, you know, Christian ceremonies, people often do touch the carcass. So I, I call it a carcass rather than a person because it's no longer a person, obviously. Yeah, usually at a memorial service, they don't call it a carcass. Yeah, I know they never call it a carcass, but let's face it. You're so insensitive. It's Pixar. very insensitive, very insensitive. But but even okay. then, it's been embalmed. <laughs> yeah, okay, Kathy. Moving on. Four <laughs> days after your August 10th podcast, the World Health Organization said, staff at the outbreak sites see evidence that the numbers of reported cases and deaths vast, vastly underestimate the magnitude of the outbreak. These steps align with recognition of the extraordinary measures needed on a massive scale to contain the outbreak in settings characterized by extreme poverty, dysfunctional health systems, a severe shortage of doctors, and rampant fear. On August 28th, WHO issued its roadmap and said, as of August 27th, the cumulative number of Ebola cases in the affected country stands at more than 3,000 with over 1,400 deaths, making this the largest Ebola outbreak ever recorded, despite significant gaps in reporting in some intense transmission areas. This roadmap assumes that in many areas of intense transmission, the actual number of cases may be two to fourfold higher than that currently reported. It acknowledges that the aggregate caseload of Ebola virus disease could exceed 20,000 over the course of this emergency. The roadmap assumes that a rapid escalation of the complementary strategies in intense transmission resource-constrained areas will allow the comprehensive application of more standard containment strategies within three months. This plan recognizes that a number of currently unaffected countries could be exposed to Ebola virus disease, but assumes that the emergency application of the standard control strategies will stop any new transmission within eight weeks of the index case. And that's the end quote of WHO's statement. So, uh, Howard says, I suggest you agree the roadmap assumptions are unrealistic, even with 20,000 cases. Why should the actual number of cases be only two to fourfold higher than the numbers reported by the respective ministries of health of Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone at 3,069 with 1,552 deaths? Very new areas are under military Oh, sorry. Very large areas are under military and poorly enforced quarantine, including the Monrovia West Point slum of perhaps 100,000 in the capital city of 1 million. Do you even know what of the infected areas are quarantined areas and the effects of inadequate food and water? Why should standard containment, i.e. the kind of containment you might expect in the U.S., exist within three months? What chances do you give that any new transmission will end within three months plus eight weeks? 
You discussed how, if this virus was transmissible as airborne aerosol, and I paraphrase, all bets would be off. A paper was published in Science, August 29, 2014. Five of the papers, more than 50 co-authors, died from Ebola before publication. We've uncovered more than 300 genetic clues about what sets this outbreak apart from previous outbreaks, said Stephen Geyer, one of the study's co-authors and an infectious disease researcher at Harvard. How do you know that mosquitoes won't puncture some of the horrifying Ebola pustules and begin spreading the disease? How do you know that the totally, totally inadequate number of needles that someone might use repeatedly after inadequate sterilization to try to rehydrate Ebola patients won't spread the infection? How do you know that the WHO allowance of continued international flights will not spread the disease? How do you know that boatloads of Ebola refugees will not spread the disease to many countries? I'm sending you something I suggest you read in penance for ignoring a realistic discussion of present and future very large suffering and death from Ebola. A copy of Jean Respel's The Camp of the Saints. This apocalyptic fiction, published in 1973, envisions hundreds of thousands of sick and desperate refugees landing in a Western country at once. Anybody read that? No. No. I read the most positive and most negative reviews on Amazon and... Neither set was compelling. Mm. So, well, um, I want to just address the idea of um, mosquitoes picking up. Yeah, I do too. But go ahead. Virus. <laughs> so, as you know, as I will always say, you know, we have to go on what we know, and um, I don't. <laughs> there's no evidence that Ebola is transmitted by mosquitoes, and I don't know any example of a virus that previously was not transmitted by mosquitoes, which suddenly is. I know viruses that yep. can switch mosquito hosts or expand their mosquito host, but not pick up a new one, which is not to say, again, that it can't happen, but it's. I think the likelihood is extremely low. And vector-borne spread, I'll, I just want to jump in before Dixon gets going, because I know he'll have a bit to say about <laughs> this. I could shut up. I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hitching a ride on an arthropod vector is a trick that viruses evolve. It's not something that just happens one day. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the biology of all of the systems like this that have been closely studied, and there are a lot of them, um, you you find that in every case, the virus or, or infectious disease of whatever kind that's spread by an arthropod has specific adaptations that it evolved to survive this very difficult transition of going through two completely different phyla of organisms. I mean, in some cases, it'll replicate in the mosquito, but in all cases, it has to find a way to get mm -hmm. from the mosquito's mouth parts to the salivary glands to get to the next host, because mosquitoes don't just fly around with a drop of blood on the tip of their nose waiting to puncture another host. After they feed, they go and they land and they digest that blood meal. And then probably go and lay eggs, and they and they clean off their proboscis a few times, and you know then that mosquito can go on and bite another host. So there's this whole period of time that the virus has to stick around on the mosquito, and that is not an easy trick to pull off. Ditto. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, one thing that reading this reminded me of was that um, in one of the links that Marion gave us was a Q and A with a researcher from Tulane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was one key thing there that, um, let's see, the interview was August 28th and this researcher has been back, um, out of Africa for almost six weeks. Um, I would be going back except there are things that are needed that I can't do over there, like be in communication with people who are funding the work and trying to get more funding and things like that. It's just impossible to do when you don't have things like fast internet and basically, that's what it comes down to, unreliable internet. So among all the things that we've been saying, you know, in the, the whole healthcare thing, there's also the fact that uh, there's a breakdown of communication. Mm. So I don't, I don't really, so we didn't, you know, we didn't list all of these things that could go wrong. There's certain, they could happen. You know, you could reuse needles, sure. We don't know if they're going to stop within eight weeks after the last case and so forth, but... I think, as we'll see later, the roadmap makes some good efforts at saying what needs to be done, and it's pretty massive undertaking, and right. I, I, don't, I don't know what else you would do. And in terms of estimating how 
big this is going to get or what measures are needed to contain it and that kind of stuff, um, uh, the people who are writing and formulating a roadmap are people who've spent their lives figuring out how to deal with this stuff. Now, right. the, the Ebola, this particular outbreak, they're going to learn a lot from this, and they may wind up making some some inaccurate uh, 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 predictions, and it may work out differently uh, than they actually predict. But there's no reason to assume that that's the prop that that's going to be the case. They're making the most uh, educated predictions that they can, and uh, uh, formulating. Uh, procedures to deal with it based on those predictions. It's a responsible activity by well-trained and uh, yeah. and expert individuals. And they're taking it. Re- one of these links in here somewhere is to a news show with Tom Frieden coming back and talking about uh, what an eye-opener it was to see this outbreak. And it's, it's clear they're taking this very seriously. Uh, that, you know, it's a big deal. Well, maybe more than when we last recorded. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we recorded on this in, what was it? I had it up here. It was August 10th. Yeah, month The roadmap ago. is like two weeks after that. Yeah. I think it's been, I mean, you look at the epi curves that we will get to later, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's really it's really picking up. So I do appreciate the uncertainty that Howard refers to but i think you have to the the way the who works is it puts things on paper and it says here's our plan and they do it and they see what happens and if it doesn't work they change it right and you can't you can't formulate a plan around oh my god the sky is falling no right so in the so this these notions about wild scenarios where where it spins out of control based on no known virology that's not productive no, and in the other outbreaks, they were more localized, and they're basing the pro- prognostications on if you could stop it for eight weeks yeah, afterwards, it sure. would be over, based on the older outbreaks that did stop after three weeks of uh, intervention. Right, so. right. And the, but the sad fact is that the situation, uh, the overall situation in the countries that are now experiencing this has gotten so much worse yeah. that um, there's just there's nothing. I mean, it's uh, I, as Kathy commented, the lack of communication, but it's just there's a lack of everything, and people have in these areas have a profound and very well placed distrust of governments and authority figures. Sure, because for a long time, you know, some places like uh, like Sierra Leone, if somebody said they were from the government, that meant they were about to hack your kids up with a machete. So it's mm-hmm. very very yeah. difficult to this. This could be stopped very quickly with some very basic equipment and information, but the information has to get to people who will listen to it and believe it. Right. Is and that's Sierra, not happening. Right. Is Senegal still uh, relatively free of Ebola? Yeah, I think there's one case in Senegal. One case. Well, right. It's, it's a new case, yeah. So there's got to be cultural differences here that account for all this. Well, there, there are structural governmental differences. In, and that's, I mean, that's you, right. That's you know, right. People, people think of Africa as one place, and we refer to this as the African Ebola outbreak, but if yeah, you compare well, one country to the next in Africa, they have radically different sure. situations. No, no and, uh, and the countries that are, that are the bulk of this epidemic are the ones that have the least of everything, that's including... Right. That's including right. trust. Indeed. Uh, I think, Rich, can you take the next one? Sure. John writes, Dear Twivers, this is the first of two letters on the same theme. I think Twiv is absolutely great and tremendously inspiring, and I tell everyone about it, so please accept the following criticism with love. <laughs> In episode 297, I was surprised at the narrow approach to ad- analyzing a roots by which Ebola viruses might spread between humans. Uh, I cannot fault you, really, because uh, none of you are clinicians, and therefore it is not in your nature to question the dogma through the lens of human variability. I'd be interested to know what you think of the following. Hold on. uh, Clinicians, by the way, don't question dogma very much. No, no. They don't even question Katma. But I I question dogma. Yes. Don't you guys? Uh, Oh, yeah. That's how science works. That's that's what science is. Okay, sorry. I really ought to make the 
my pick of the week, this XKCD cartoon about how <laughs> science is done. I'll, pu- I'll put it in here somewhere. Maybe it could be. A- have you seen this cartoon? Uh, when I have time, I'll embed it and you guys can see it. Um, first, there was a discussion of the experiment with the rest and strain of Ebola in which pigs transmitted the virus by air to monkeys. The conclusion seemed to be that because the pig- pigs produce larger aerosol droplets than primates, primates cannot trans- transmit the virus by aerosol route. But what about situations where humans produce large or especially virus-laden droplets? For example, people with uh, lung abscess can cause up chunks of lung tissue. More commonly, people with pulmonary tuberculosis cough up blood. And what about a person that has a simple chest cold with thick mucus who is also coughing up 10 times more than normal? Such coexisting conditions will not be uncommon in a population with poor underlying health. If tissue or blood or mucus propelled by a cough or maybe a pig-like growth Run, uh, were to land on a healthcare worker's cornea or oral mucosa, it would not be far fetched uh, at all if infection follows. Well, that's contact with yeah. uh, body fluid. Uh-huh. Okay? That's, that's, how it not aeros- that's not aerosol transmission. Aerosol is if you <clears throat> sneeze and a guy at the back of the room gets infected. Right. This is exactly how Ebola spreads. That's right. And that's why you need the gowns and the goggles. Mechanisms like this may explain cases in which the infection of healthcare workers is otherwise mysterious. I believe, therefore, that you should say humans do not classically transmit uh, uh, aerosol viruses by uh, Ebola viruses by aerosol routes, but there are circumstances in which it would be possible. Yes, uh, it is still exposure to body fluids that is the key factor, but it is nevertheless via the aerosol route. Uh, in the and. And in the future, always be suspicious of absolute statements like humans cannot do X because there are likely pathological states where they can. A- Alan. Aerosol transmission has a specific definition, and this would not be it. Right. I mean, you, Sec- gotta, you compare flu versus this. And again, in a, you know, in a subway, you can sneeze. One person can sneeze or in an airplane, right? And the virus will infect everyone. It's not the same. And that's what we were saying. So there's just no evidence of that explosive aerosol spread. It's characteristic of measles, uh, influenza, even smallpox, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these things are uh, uh, epidemiologic. Uh, I mean, they have mechanism, but they show up epidemiologically as well. And the epidemiology doesn't support any of the mechanisms. Second, there was no discussion of the possibility of super spreaders, despite the jaw-dropping statement that the virus can persist in semen for 61 days. Uh, you can find there have been investigations that reveal viral nucleic acids in semen right. for a period of time. And in fact, I don't know where this is in this stuff, uh, but I've read because of all of this that, in fact, there's no virus that people can detect this suggests yes, that's in the scientific american article that we'll get to okay this suggests uh, either that some people can tolerate a more chronic infection or that there are uh, immunologically privileged sites in the virus where the uh, in the vi- in the body where the virus may remain the prostate is also known to be such a site the lens of the eye is another recall that typhoid mary was able to harbor salmonella typhi bacteria in her gallbladder without harming herself and there are actually lots of precedents for chronic viral infection of uh, specific tissues well all we can say again is epidemiologically and from what we know so far there is uh, no evidence for either super spreaders or uh, this sort of uh, persistent or chronic infection in the case of Ebola let me just repeat Lin Fa Wong's statement to me. Anybody can do PCR. You have to find infectious virus. It's not the same thing. If one in a thousand can become a super spreader or chronically infected, it would not be surprising that none of us is detected. Uh, uh, none has been detected in past outbreaks, which uh, have all been much smaller than that. Well, maybe chronic infections and super spreaders will show up eventually, but so far, no evidence. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, the idea that there might be super spreaders is, is uh, an interesting idea, but uh, there's no evidence for it so far, as far as I know. Uh, finally, uh, why was there no discussion about the mutation rate in Ebola viruses? Right now, there are trillions of virus particles in densely populated cities. Unlike the past Ebola outbreaks, <clears throat> in, uh, outbreaks in lightly populated areas, a mutation that allows aerosol transmission 
would certainly find a susceptible host nearby uh, with consequences too horrible to contemplate. It would be interesting for me and perhaps for the rest of your audience to understand that at the molecular level, uh, understand uh, at the molecular level why Ebola viruses are not classically transmitted through the air to hear your estimation of how much attention, how much alteration the virus would require to become air transmissible. Mm -hmm. Of course, that would be a roadmap to a potent bioweapon about which I'll say more in the next letter. Okay, so we've already had that discussion already uh, in the podcast, so refer to above. And I also think that uh, this is an interesting, uh, he's advocating doing gain-of-function experiments, which I think is interesting. And I will also add that um, we know that the Soviet Union tried very, very hard to develop an aerosolized Ebola virus strain. Oh. During their during their bioweapons program, as part of the disclosures that eventually came out of that from people like Ken Alabeck, um, we know that that was an active, ongoing research program with uh, massive public support in the Soviet Union. Um, they failed. Why the viruses do not transmit by aerosol is a really good question. It yeah. is a darn good question, and you know that's people have been trying to figure out that for H five N one, for for good cause, as because your interest uh, for in Ebola, it's the same thing with H five N one, and they're getting hell for trying to do those experiments, so they're not proceeding very quickly. This sounds like the early days of HIV, <laughs> where they were worried about transmission in mosquitoes and contact yeah. and that sort of thing, and people yeah. in public would hug an HIV person just to prove to everybody that you can't catch it this way. Right. And indeed you can't, but uh, it took a long time, and it was a lot of uh, social marketing that actually got the job done. And that's going to be true here, too, because there have been so many um, pseudo-scientific science fiction movies where the facts were completely ignored, and it was just said, okay, here's what's going to happen. And, you know, like uh, Outbreak Z with Brad Pitt, what the name of that movie was, I forgot, but... Uh, uh, oh, it, 12 Monkeys? No, no, no. It was. Um, oh, 12 Monkeys. Wow. No, no. That was even <laughs> more fanciful, <laughs> at least entertaining, but certainly nothing to do with the truth. But nobody knows what, they, what they're supposed to believe when they see these things and hear about them by hearsay and read no, them. It was uh, uh, World War Z. World War Z. Yeah, exactly right. Actually, 12 Monkeys was Brad Pitt. <laughs> oh, it was? Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought that was. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, what a great movie. At any rate, we, we got to finish Bruce John's Willis. letters here. Go okay? ahead, go ahead. I realize that avoiding panic is important, uh, and I must insert here, which is exactly why we don't go off on a lot of these tangents. Uh, and that communicating the nuanced probabilities of above considerations will be difficult. Admittedly, they are statistically minor factors. But we cannot afford to be dogmatic. We must realize that improbable events can kill people unprepared for them. If anyone can rise to the communication talents, it's TWIV. Well, thanks for bringing all this stuff up, John, because it gives us an opportunity to, you know, go through it. And I think we've, you know, done that pretty, pretty thoroughly. You really have to be... Uh, uh, careful to uh, use the science to uh, measure what sort of scenarios you're going to uh, regard as, as uh, credible. And there are a lot of those things that are coming up, the panic things that are coming up that uh, are just not credible. Yeah, I mean, we do appreciate bringing these up. These, a lot of these themes are going to come up more, more, more again in this podcast. And people um, need to hear them discussed. I think it's fine. Know? But, you know, the problem is TWIV is heard by, you know, tens of thousands of people, but it needs to be heard by millions of people, and we're not going to have that opportunity because we're too long. Um, so it, it ends up the press's job, and they take the point that, oh, could this mutate to be transmissible? <laughs> I mean, I heard a reporter at ICAC recently ask during a, a session, what's the chance that it will mutate to be transmissible? You know, the kind of question you can't answer. All you can say is what we have said so far today, and a lot of people don't like that when scientists do that. Mm -hmm. And and I would just say, remember, uh, John points out that improbable events can kill people, um, but remember that probable events are much more likely to kill them. <laughs> mm. And there are a lot of diseases yeah. we really should be worried about that we're not as worried about as we should be. Well, well, we'll talk, talk later, later about, about a disease that, that people are worried about, about but it's, it's not, not killing, killing anyone. 
so that's, far. That's that that way, one I'm actually a little more concerned about. That's the way viruses go, you know. But um, I do think that the low probability stuff, yeah, we we do tend to talk about it. But as you'll see, when it gets in the newspapers, it's not really good because it gives the wrong impression. Right. And there's all this, you know, all of this discussion about uh, these these African countries than this worst Ebola epidemic ever. And, and yeah, that's bad. But look at the malaria rates in these countries. Here, here. Uh, yes. I'm kind of reminded of the um, question, you know, where you ask someone, have you stopped beating your wife? Mm-hmm. There's no good answer to that question, but now <laughs> it's been brought up. You know, so it's kind of the same thing about, well, you know, what would it take for this virus to become aerosol transmitted? Well, we don't know. Well, you know, how likely why not? is it? How likely is it? <laughs> not very. Yeah. So, yeah. I would say don't worry about it. Yeah. So I figured based on these follow ups, we should talk a little bit more about the Ebola outbreak because it's certainly intensified since we talked about it a month ago. Yep. And. I don't know. I found over 3,600 cases so far, um, mostly in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. There are a number in Nigeria. And apparently there's an unrelated outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Different virus, different um, uh, spillover from an animal. Mm -hmm. So there is um, there's a, a good source. I have a whole bunch of links to give everyone today. Of course, WHO has a Outbreak news, the latest one on their website is from September 4th, which uh, gives 3,685 cases, probable, confirmed, and suspected, 1,841 deaths. And an interesting, a letter that will, or op ed that we'll talk about in a bit, they say over 4,000 cases. I don't know where that number came from. I haven't found that anywhere. But this page is nice because it breaks it down by country. Um, so that's a good one. And then there is <laughs> something got pasted into you. Uh, yeah, this is the XK, <laughs> XKCD cartoon. You have to see it. <laughs> oh, I have that one up on my wall. It's so perfect. <laughs> yes. That's great. Yep. It's got cool. a sign. I just got to say, it. it's got a sign. It's got somebody pulling a lever and it gets zapped by lightning and fried. <laughs> and then it has two other circles one is the reaction of a normal person to this says i guess i shouldn't do that and mm -hmm. the scientist says i wonder if that happens every time and he's about to pull <laughs> the lever again which is exactly yeah okay sorry yeah. uh cdc has put up a what looks like a new page since we last talked on the uh, ebola 2014 ebola outbreak in west africa with news highlights they have case counts on the right it's a three column Does format. A map they do have a map right here dixon Excellent. see that Excellent. And if you click it, Dixon, yes. you know, you put your mouse over Yeah, no, 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 I know. You get a, bi you get a bigger you know, version. You guys are just... So yeah. you can see the neighboring countries, you know, the, oh, like that's Senegal. that's how that works. <laughs> okay. So it's a nice website to check out um, what's going on here. Are there any... On the map, I meant to ask you. Yes. Are there any densely populated areas that don't have it that are surrounded by areas that do have it? I don't think you can tell from that map, but okay. I've seen some other maps which go a little more granular. Okay. 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 Now, I wanted to also point out everyone, there is a, um, situ so the WHO also does what are called situation reports. Right. And the one of September 5th has an epidemiological curve mm. where you can see um, right. around week, uh, I don't know, 25, it's it starts to take off. Getting worse rather than. And this is uh, broken up by number, of, by the different countries, mm -hmm. according to color here. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice chart. So it's really, right. yeah, it's increasing exponentially. Yep. Uh, the CDC has a nice infographic on their website, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. um, just with some pictures and simple facts, you know, yep. the likely host. One in two people who get Ebola have died. How do you get it? Direct contact, objects, infected animals. Right. They have the symptoms, um, the time when you're able to spread the disease to others, and they say after 21 days, if an exposed person does not develop symptoms, they will not become sick with Ebola. Mm. Although I would hearken back to our previous letter and say there's always going to be an exception, right? But that's the general rule. But it's a nice infographic to uh, put in public places. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Now, um, the document that um, I think it was Howard referred to, the uh, roadmap, 
which WHO issued. Uh, it's online now because yesterday I couldn't get it. It's a 27-page document about what they feel needs to be done to stop transmission, and they say within six to nine months and prevent it from spreading uh, elsewhere. And I, I highly recommend that everyone uh, have a look at this because it's broken down uh, into very specific um, sections. They have a what, this is, what the assumptions that, that this roadmap is based on, and they say we have 40 years' experience in, in uh, working on this disease, Ebola virus disease, and this is what we've learned, and this is what we're going to put into play. So, for example, objective one, to achieve full geographic coverage with complementary Ebola response activities in countries with widespread and intense transmission. And then they have a number of priority activities of what they're going to do. And these are um, intensive activities. They're going to involve a lot of countries and a lot of resources, prohibiting travel, for example, monitoring people at airports, um, in improving the, the health infrastructure, you know, getting resources in that are needed, training people for fast response and so forth. Um, and um, point objective two, uh, to ensure emergency and immediate application of comprehensive Ebola response interventions in countries with an initial case or with localized transmission. So if a country has some new cases, boom, we're going to go in there and stop them before it, it, it spreads even further. Objective three, strengthen the preparedness of all countries to detect and respond to Ebola exposure, not just the ones sharing borders, but everybody, whoever a, a case could fly to. What what can we do to get them ready for that? And they talk about the issues that are going to be involved in doing this, the human resources, the paying people, telling them what the risks are going to be if you help us work on this, You know, mobilizing international expertise, uh, getting health workers in and so forth, what the community is going to do, how we're going to build up laboratories, how we're going to get the equipment in, the personal protective equipment and so forth. So this is really an intense document. It just this is a detail, very detailed point-by-point -point plan for the best strategies that the world's experts in this disease have identified for combating this epidemic. So I, I recommend you have a look at it. I, as someone mentioned earlier, it may not work, but I think you have to have a place to start with. It certainly won't right. work if it's not implemented. And you need to have buy-in by many different countries that have the money to do this. Yep. So it's now it's everyone's problem, right? It's not just African problem. We have to help. And um, I think at some point here in my list of uh, references, I have an, an article um, – well, from the Washington Post, Gates Foundation donates $50 million. And so that's, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do with the money, but um, it will be part of this plan. I, I, he says we want to accelerate development of treatments, vaccines, and diagnostics. You know, that's not easy to do. Well, if no. that's just money going to, if that's money going to research, that's great, but that's not going to be, that's not going to be part of the response plan. That's the WHO the roadmap plan. is a is a response plan. It's what right. do you need to do right this instant. Right. Alan, uh, referencing back to your uh, allusion to the Russian studies, did they uh, publish anything after that as to whether or not Ebola could spread to other animal species rather than just humans and bats? I don't know exactly what got declassified with that. So I've I've only read kind of mm -hmm. the top line summary of it, but I it. It was clear that they had done substantial research on trying to get it to spread through aerosols, and it didn't work out. Right. And I think did, that's that. That was um, you know as a result right. they just stockpiled more smallpox. If I wanted to express any concern at all, it would be at that level rather than whether you can aerosolize it or mosquito borne it. You know, because another animal species like cattle or dogs or cats or something like this could uh, increase the complexity of the epidemiologic approach. Yes. Uh, last weekend and the beginning of this week, the uh, ICAC, the Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, took place in Boston. And as part of that, they broadcast... Uh, Wasn't it Washington? Oh, sorry, Washington. I get the two cities confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Michael Schmidt, my co-host on TWIM, did a bunch of talk shows with various people in the meeting. And one is on Ebola, and uh, it has Barbara Knust from the CDC, Gary Kobinger from Winnipeg. 
It's part of the National Microbiology Lab there. And uh, Anish Mita, who is at Emory and helped care for some of the patients. So hmm. kind of interesting things you can glean from that. Hmm. And Anish's main point was, you know, we gave them good intravenous fluids. Right. And that was a big deal in helping them live. Yep. So check that out. Uh, another thing that's been in the news is that a variety of vaccines and um, therapies are going into accelerated trials. Yes. And one of them is a vaccine, um, which is reported on CNN, which the U.S., uh, FDA, and NIH are pushing forward uh, in a test. They're doing a phase one. So, sorry about that. <laughs> phase one. This is awful for podcasting, these autoplay videos. Yeah, they just turn off the sound. <laughs> I need to hear my co-hosts, you know. Is Kathy having... We lost Kathy. We did. Oh, okay. Kath Kathy, are you there? Kathy. No, no, I'm back. Gone. Yes, I'm Ah, back. you're back. Okay. <laughs> yep. We almost lost her. Jim. Um, and this particular vaccine, um, again, as I said, it's going to be a phase one, which is just safety testing. Uh, you know, the paper was just published describing this vaccine, Um a couple of days ago in Nature Medicine, Brief Communications, uh, August 18th, uh, chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine generates acute and durable protective immunity against Ebola virus a challenge. So this was a small company um, that was recently acquired by Glaxo, and uh, they've developed this um, in collaboration with people here at the uh, NIH. And in fact, the Integrated Research Facility, which is a BSL-4 laboratory, because that's how you test these vaccines in a, a non-human primate model using infectious Ebola virus. So I just need to stop here and say all the people who have said we should shut down our BSL-3 and 4 labs, these vaccines would never have gotten to this point if we had shut them down. Now, how do you feel about saying that when we know that we can save some lives if we get these things tested? Right. I just think this is so short-sighted to make statements, dogmatic well, statements like that. I'm not being personally insulting. I'm not insulting anyone. I'm just saying it's really not the right thing to do. It's not short-sighted, though. That's the wrong word to use, actually. It's ignorance. I don't want to insult people. I've I'm been accused insulting of them. insulting people. No, no. Uneducated. Right. <laughs> they're, not, they're, not, they're not aware of the facts, and therefore they're making these blanket statements that really shouldn't be made because they don't have all the facts to begin with. This is actually a cool vaccine um, because um, you know they had tried to use adenovirus type 5, which is a human serotype, and it didn't protect the animals. So they used the chimpanzee-derived adenovirus. Uh, they used several, two different serotypes here. And they found the chimpanzee adenovirus type 3 worked very well. They put the glycoprotein of uh, Ebola virus in this vector. Got it. Protects them. They get a, a one shot and a boost, I believe. Um, and they mm. also use a, um, a modified vaccinia how, how vector. How soon after they're vaccinated does the protection kick in? Yeah, that's in the paper. <laughs> oh. Let's see. Uh, Let's go to the video. Three weeks too. of immunization. Three weeks. Yeah, that's one of the things that's, I wanted to know because you sure. might be able to use this. Exactly. And at last, it's durable. I think they challenged some of them 10 months later and they were still uh, protected. So for the, so Caleb's, for the Caleb's out there, right. uh, <laughs> this is, um, uh, there, uh, as, I, as I said a, a twiv or so ago, there's only one example of a recombinant virus vectored vaccine that I know of that is uh, commercially available in the world, and that's the um, uh, Chimeravax uh, vectored, uh, uh, what is it, um, Venezuelan equine encephalitis or something, like one, of those, one of those viruses. Um, and so this would be, if this, you know, this would be the second and the only in, hum in, in human use adenovirus vector mm. thing. So adenovirus is a completely different virus than Ebola. Oh, yeah, it's a double-stranded DNA virus, and they're cloning the glycoprotein gene from Ebola into a region of adenovirus that is otherwise necessary for its replication. So it's a crippled adenovirus that uh, you infect cells with it, and during the course of that crippled infection, it expresses this protein. And the uh, uh, the boost. Now, the problem, as Vincent already said, is that uh, 
you can't use an adenovirus that's a human adenovirus that people commonly have because apparently your pre-existing immunity to that will compromise the activity of the vaccine. Right. So that's why you use the chimp adenovirus. But you can only use that once, right? Because you're going to mount an immune that's response true. to that vector. So what you do is boost with another recombinant virus, this time a pox virus that's using the like mm-hmm. third generation smallpox vaccine, MVA, with the Ebola virus glycoprotein uh, cloned to that. Once again, a completely different vector. This is fascinating to see this stuff uh, all of a sudden become red hot. Kathy, you were mm-hmm. going to say something? Oh, I thought it was because I, I misread the, uh, the challenge time. It, they say specifically CD8 positive T cell responses within three weeks. So uh, that might not be the exact same thing as when it's effective against what are you challenge. assume what are you assuming in this case is the mechanism of protection right yeah so in figure 1 no, that was a question they, that was a question they challenge it 3 weeks <laughs> uh, after 3 okay. weeks after vaccination so this is vectors. you're assuming igg responses well, it's are both responsible Dixon. they they have both antibody and cellular responses but which one protects well they didn't do the experiment to try and do that's extremely either important one. though because the but, people who have recovered from this infection are about to donate serum to help save the lives of the people that have it. Well clearly um So does well, hyperimmune serum actually work? Yeah, I, I think we said at the last TWIV on Ebola that the correlative protection is is antibody, neutralizing okay. antibody okay. in the serum. Okay. But um yeah, I think it is three weeks, Kathy, as far as yeah. we can see. Okay. So this is pretty cool. They say at the end, this is the first time that we can demonstrate acute and durable immunity against Ebola using a single inoculation, in which case you get partial protection, or prime boost vaccine regimen, you get uniform protection. And this vaccine will be beneficial for populations at acute risk during natural outbreaks or others. So phase one, you know, it's going to take a year. Um, so this is probably not going to be ready for this outbreak, but it really needs to be tested, at least a safety test, Right. Right. Yep. Just to make sure it doesn't do anything worse than than Ebola is doing. Although one can argue that it's not much worse than dying, right? Um, so that's pretty neat. And as Rich said, you know, before this outbreak, these these vaccines and and therapies were kind of languishing, and now it's clear that this is this is going to happen at a big scale. Sure. So, and again, can't do it without a BSL four. All right. Um, there's a great article in Scientific American by Dina Fine Maron. Ebola doctor reveals how infected Americans were cured. It's a question and answer between uh, the physician, uh, one of the physicians that took care of the two Americans who were initially brought back uh, to Emory. And I really liked it because you can, you know, the physician is kind of aware of what's going on and, and has great answers. Yeah. Um, I pers- including I don't know. Including I don't know. <laughs> and including you don't know. Right. Okay. So I want to just highlight a couple of things that I thought were cool. The reporter says, what sort of lessons did you get? And then the physician says, we're not being critical of our colleagues in Africa. They have a terrible lack of infrastructure and the sort of testing that everyone in our society takes for granted, like doing a complete blood count, just doesn't get done. And two patients who were brought back from from Libya, Liberia, hadn't didn't have that done. It's just a, a basic blood count, okay, and also fluids. Um, we found in general that among our Ebola patients, because the amount of fluid they lost through diarrhea and vomiting, they had a lot of electrolyte electrolyte abnormalities, replacing that with standard fluids used in hospital settings without monitoring will not do a very good job of replacing things like sodium and potassium. So you have to be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> there was another thing that I liked here um, that I really liked. What was it? Um, sh- they said uh, it had to do with the shedding, I think. Um, they said basically we hear that you know, that people can shed virus for a long time. Are these people going to be, you know, in the semen, for example? Are these, do these peop- Did you tell these people certain things? And the, and the physician basically says, you know, that's PCR. We don't know if there's virus there. There's no mm-hmm. indication that. Th- and I think that's great. That is good. It's absolutely great because you can imagine that a physician would say PCR positive. That's it. There's virus there. But I, I really like that. Um, and there were a few other things that. Oh, they, they ask, you know, how do these ZMAP and, and the infusions of antibodies, how they work? And the, and the physician says, I don't know. 
There's only two people. There are no controls. We can't uh, conclude he anything. He follows up that thing about uh, shedding. Uh, yeah, that, that's where I got that thing about uh, PCR versus infectivity. And then he follows that up with uh, epidemiology. He says, looking at Ebola survivors that were discharged and successfully resolved the infection, following up several months later and evaluating family members, there has never been any evidence that family members became infected. Blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, one of the strategies that occurs to me as we've been talking here is that it's got a 50% case mortality rate. And it, a lot of people. So 50% of the people who are diagnosed with symptoms go on to die from this infection. That's what it says. Not, well, it depends, Dixon. Okay, but it varies. But I mean, go ahead with so your far, point. So far, yeah, well, the point of what I'm trying to raise is that why can't we recruit healthcare workers from the survivors since there's so many of them? If there's, well, permanent sure immunity, that... if there's permanent immunity, the people that are closest to the patients in these countries mm -hmm. could be the people who have already survived the outbreak. I think that's actually, uh, I, I, I wish I had a link for this, but I just saw some news photo recently in the, in the background reading for this, which I have unfortunately not bookmarked, where they were, <clears throat> they were kind of deputizing a group of survivors yeah. of this epidemic in, I think, Sierra Leone, and, and trying to get them, and, and getting them trained in how to deal okay. with okay. this virus so yes. that they could send yes. them out into the community. Right. Uh, one last thing I wanted to point out. Thank the, you, the physician said, the other thing I would hope we would get across to the public is this is a disease where we don't have to have a lot of secondary infections if we follow standard infection control procedures. We had 26 people giving direct patient care to these patients, and we did not have any secondary infections at all. Right. We use contact precautions and droplet precautions. Fortunately, we don't have to go to that level of protection. We, you wear whatever you need so that blood and body secretions don't come into contact with you depending on the quantity of fluid. So again, if this were aerosol transmitted, that would not work. That's right. right. Anyway, I highly recommend you. Yeah, it's take a nice a look article. At this. Mm -hmm. It's really a really great nice article. article. Mm -hmm. uh, WHO says that, as we've already heard before, um, but there could be more than 20,000 cases here. And you heard one of our letters earlier saying could be more, but there's a New York Times article where Bruce Eilward of WHO, who Alan and I know from polio years ago, uh, has made these as as an interview, and he talks about that. So twenty thousand that would it's a serious thing. It's yep. a lot of people. You bet. Uh, apparently now there are four Americans that have been infected. I found an article on ProMed Mail uh, that says that fourth American contracted EVD in West Africa expected to arrive in the USA for care on September tenth and will be treated at Emory. So um, there was another one. I think the third one went to. Uh, uh, Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska. Nebraska. Right. right. Now, Michael Schmidt sent me a link to a Ebola infection control resource list. So um, if any of our listeners are needing any of this information or if you're just curious, uh, it's a very nice list of stuff involved in uh, how to control infection. It's from the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Right. And uh, the NIH, the um, not the NIH, uh, the National S Library of Medicine has uh, launched an emergency access initiative giving free access to books and journals uh, about Ebola, basically. So I'll give you a link for uh, those resources. So that's really nice. Science Magazine has made a collection of Ebola papers open access. So basically what they've published in the last couple of years um, it's all there. Everybody can read them. So get them now, download them, save them, and when we do them on Twiv, you'll have them. That's right. <laughs> and the last, uh, well, two more things. One is um, what I thought was a silly article in Newsweek. Smuggled bushmeat is Ebola's back door to America. <sighs> Cover story on Newsweek. Picture of a chimpanzee looking pensive. Smoke. With a title, with a title, backdoor for Ebola. It's ridiculous. The implication being that this is a backdoor, right? So I sent this article to Ian Lipkin, <laughs> <laughs> and because he had actually done recently a survey of bushmeat that comes into 
New York. A lot comes into the city here, you know, monkey parts and bones and skins. And most of this is dried out and smoked and so forth. It's not really raw meat. Um, and they confiscated it. And he looked by PCR and found a variety of sequences, no Ebola virus sequences. So there's no, there's no evidence that there's any infectious virus here. But they're saying that, you know, this could introduce the virus. Just and, like AIDS. You know, I, I was thinking of... Uh, when Alan was talking about the Soviet efforts to weaponize the virus, how unstable it is. And they, they decided it was too unstable to do this. So I doubt it would survive any of these procedures that they use to uh, produce bushmeat. And whether there would be enough virus there or to do anything, if there's any f infectious virus at all. So uh, Ian Lipkin's group didn't look for infectious virus. They only looked by PCR. So I, I just think there's very little evidence that any of this is... Um, problematic, yet it's a full-blown story in Newsweek, which is going to get people thinking. Um, I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's okay to, to say, could this be an issue, get some facts and decide not, but they're not doing that. They're just saying, hey, look at this. Could be. Could be. Right. I, wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't be worried about Ebola on bush meat, but it is overall a public health concern. Yeah, that's why we don't want it brought in. It, part, yeah, I right? mean, it's it's unregulated meat. It's um, yeah. this stuff is not inspected by the USDA or anybody else. It's uh, um, could be could be infected with all kinds of stuff, but not yeah. Ebola. But not Ebola. And finally, um, September 11th. Boy, what a day to publish this that op-ed by Michael Osterholm, who we've talked about previously here on TWIV. What we're afraid to say about. Ebola. And he is basically talking about what might happen here. Um, and, and what I want to focus on, he writes, the second possibility is one that virologists are loath to discuss openly, but are definitely considering in private that an Ebola virus could mutate to become transmissible through the air. Ugh. If certain mutations occurred, it would mean that just breathing would put one at risk of contracting Ebola. I wonder if he knows those mutations. If certain mutations? Yeah. How do you know? You have to do the gain-of-function experiments. Right. And which, then, he, which he opposes. Then he says infections could spread quickly to every part of the globe, as the H1 influenza virus did in 2009. So this is the connection of unrelated facts that really bothers me you know this virus could acquire aerosol transmissibility and it could be like flu which travels around the globe mm. no there's no connection between those two one of the things that really uh, uh troubles me about this is the implication that there's some sort of conspiracy among scientists not to talk about something that's really dangerous because because uh, you yeah. know they don't want it to blow up and and that is just crazy I mean, we talked about it's it. Crazy. I, of course, I know Michael doesn't listen to Twiv, but we talked about it, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. We've just spent almost an hour and a half talking yeah, about I it. Mean, a month ago, we does talked this about imply it? that Osterholm is not a scientist because he's not afraid to talk about it? He's a public health official. Exactly. And he writes here, why are public officials afraid to discuss this? They don't want to be accused of screaming fire in a crowded theater, as a, a theater, as I'm sure some will accuse me of doing. But the risk is real. And until we consider it, the world will not be prepared to do what is necessary to end the epidemic. Yes, I would say the risk is theoretical as far and as... Extremely remote. Saying it's real Almost means negligible. it could happen, you know, it's imminent. But that's not correct. I think this is fear-mongering. It is. And that's pretty much become his shtick, which is unfortunate because he's a smart guy. I've talked to him. I got an email from a science writer in India who I correspond with in... He asked me, is this, is this aerosol transmission thing right? And I said, mm -hmm. no. And he said, I thought so. I always take what, what Michael says with a grain of salt. Yeah. So I, I find this disturbing because, you know, then he, then he cites the, uh, the transmission experiments done between pigs and non-human primates, which we discussed last time. You know, and we also cited the follow-up paper, which I think has some of the same authors on it, right? That's which correct. basically shows that that doesn't happen when you, go, when you try and go from from primate to primate. That's correct. Which um, So it totally undercuts the entire thesis of this even I mean even apart from the issue that pigs are not people. So They're you closer know closer to people than ferrets. So the, he provides this, you know, a little bit of a, of scientific data here as a way of saying, you know, this this could happen. And I don't think I think again this is misleading. So this is very disturbing to me and um, 
you know, take a look at it. But I thought it's very bothersome because uh, I, I think it's fine to talk about what we need to do. But to couch it in terms of this could go airborne and we need to do this, this is absolutely not correct. And also, as Rich pointed out, to couch it in terms of these are secrets that scientists are keeping from you is is just way, way off base. Yeah, we, we're all talking about it. But the point is that, well, yeah, do not link. <laughs> we don't want to give the Times any... Uh any Google foo. Um, <laughs> we certainly talk about it. and But the thing is, you you end up saying, well, it's probably a really low probability event because we haven't seen it before. And, I, and as we said earlier, people are not happy with that. So, this, What is this uh, image that's in this article? Mm-hmm. Can you make any sense out of that? As some artist who was told to probably draw... Um, Somebody draw, starting draw an infection or something. Well, those look like bacteria to me. Yeah, spreading sure. in nerves. Either yeah. that, or somebody had Actually, a really unfortunate uh, run-in with a with a. Uh, it looks more like bush. legumes. I see these as root nodes. Yeah, uh, Jules with nod. uh, <laughs> <laughs> It could be. Sorry. It could be. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. I think that's that's it for Ebola for now. <laughs> right. I, I wanted to say that I did look up one thing about aerosol transmission and it says NIOSH defines aerosols as a suspension of tiny particles or droplets in the air. Aerosol transmission has been defined as person-to-person transmission of pathogens through the air by means of inhalation of infectious particles. Particles up to 100 microns in size are considered inhalable. And then they talk about if they're smaller like 10 microns they can penetrate deeper. Great. Do you have have a link you can put in for that? Yeah, I do. Good. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, work with uh, viruses that are transmitted by aerosol droplets or can be transmitted by aerosol droplets that are larger uh, is actually regulated uh, in terms of uh, biocontainment differently than uh, stuff that is... Uh, classically aerosol transmitted that is small mm. small particles there's a there's a huge difference here in what we're talking about all right we have another uh, little epidemic i want to talk about and uh, i first learned of this last saturday uh, kathy and rich and i had a meeting in chicago for the american society for virology and we started at 4 p.m on saturday and mark palanch from the cdc walked in and said, oh, I just came from Good Morning America. I did an interview about this respiratory virus. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, Entero 68 has been uh, infecting Kansas, Kansas City and Chicago. So then I, I looked into it, and in fact, I got an email from uh, Marcy on Facebook, and she wrote, Enterovirus D68 has been all over the news in the past few days. I thought entero meant intestines, but this causes primarily respiratory symptoms. Am I confusing two similar words? What do you know about this virus? It seems to cause severe respiratory symptoms in those with other respiratory issues. Is it a relatively new virus, or is the current outbreak just worse than usual? Thanks. Marcy from Pittsburgh, where it is currently 74 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny, dew point 56 degrees. Enterovirus 68 it is a picornavirus. Mem- remember the same family mm-hmm. as polio My virus. Single-stranded, <laughs> single-stranded positive sense RNA naked capsid. i got to get that in. Right. Naked capsids, that's <laughs> like right. Like the rhinoviruses, which like are respiratory. Rhinoviruses. There's going to be a right. quiz. There's going to be a quiz. <laughs> uh, Enterovirus 68 was uh, first isolated in the 1960s from a couple of kids in California with uh, respiratory symptoms. And uh, it turned out to be a new virus. And based on its physical and chemical properties, back then there was no nucleotide sequencing. Based on its physical and chemical properties, they said this is a picornavirus and we're going to put it in the enterovirus group. Uh, And since then, it hasn't done a lot in the U.S. Uh, According to the CDC, between 2003 and 2013, there were 79 reported cases. But what's happened in Kansas City and in Chicago there were outbreaks of respiratory illness, mainly among uh, young kids. Uh, they couldn't figure out what virus it was, so they sent samples to CDC, and it came up positive for uh, enterovirus type 68. And the, the outbreak is probably bigger than we know. There's now 
quite a bit of serious respiratory disease in other cities, and CDC is working on seeing what that is. Now, you can't just use PCR to diagnose this because um, it won't dis- use what do you what you do to see if there's an enterovirus involved in these infections. You use primers that amplify many different enteroviruses. They're called pan enteroviral primers. If you get a positive, then you have to sequence the DNA that you get. And that's what CDC does um, to figure out its enterovirus 68. Actually, you have to do RT-PCR with the... Yes, reverse transcriptase PCR. So 1962 isolated in in California. Um, It's primarily a respiratory pathogen. There's one report in the literature that I found where they found it in a child that had died of paralytic disease. They found it in the child's stool. But it seems to be transmitted by the respiratory route. You can find the virus, you know, in, in nasal secretions, saliva, and so forth. So it's probably aerosol transmitted. Um, and it causes a respiratory disease. And these kids, many of them have been hospitalized uh, because they have trouble breathing. They start to wheeze or they can't breathe, so they have to go in the hospital to get assistance with breathing. And as far as I can tell so far, there have been no fatalities. You, you treat them for about a week so they can breathe. And um, then they recover. Uh, and they go home. Yeah, a lot of them have had to go to the uh, to the ICU. ICU, yeah. So it's it can be pretty serious, and not all the ones who end up in the hospital and in the ICU have previous history of of respiratory problems. Right. right. So it is in some I mean, the majority do, but uh, it's like 60, 70, 60, 70 percent um, are kids with history of asthma or wheezing, but some are just you know healthy kids who got this thing and landed them in the hospital. So the question is, why are we having an outbreak? Well, Mark Palanche says um, we may have just gotten to the point where we're recognizing more frequently something that has always happened in the past. You know, laboratories are sending us specimens, and maybe in the past they wouldn't have done that, and we wouldn't have figured out what it was. Why it would suddenly be causing an outbreak is anybody's guess. This can happen at the end of the summer. You get these outbreaks of enterovirus infections. They're very common. They're very common. Um um, so, you know, the, the sequence will be obtained. It's already out there, but I'm not, I doubt that will tell us anything about uh, what's going on here because the sequences will be different from all the intro 68s that are already out there. But it, it will be interesting in the future to continue to track this and see if this is an unusual thing or if it really is just a measuring issue. Right. So that, of course, will depend on the hospitals sending specimens to the CDC. And, and the name uh, enterovirus? Vincent? Okay, so that's the other thing with this. So, so you know, Marcy said, why is it an enterovirus? Well, Good question. Yeah, well, basically, <laughs> it's not a good name. So way back when, you know, the first enterovirus discovered was poliovirus, and this was before it was called an enterovirus, and polio infects in the intestine and replicates in its shed in the stool, spreads from person to person by fecal oral contamination. And over the years, people would isolate new viruses that looked a lot like polio. They had biological and physical properties resembling polio, so they'd be classified as an enterovirus. Eventually, the name enterovirus was given to this subgroup of the picornavirus, the idea being that they initiate infection in the, resp- in the enteric tract. Well, at some point, some viruses were added because of these properties, is again, before sequencing. And it was clear that they infected the respiratory tract. Some of them, the Coxsackie viruses, can infect both the respiratory and the enteric tracts. And then sequencing came on the scene, and we began classifying viruses according to sequence. And a number of years ago, based on sequences, it was decided that rhinoviruses should be enteroviruses. They should be classified because they're pretty similar. They used to have their own genus called the rhinoviruses. But Mm. now enteroviruses include poliovirus, Coxsackie, Echo, other enteroviruses like 68, and rhinoviruses. So that's why we have our rhino up our entero. Oof. (laughs) Oof. Oof. You know, when when the ICTV did this reclassification, I said... This is not a good idea to call rhinoviruses enteroviruses. And I remember Ann Palmenberg saying, just get used to it, Vinny. <laughs> but you can see people get confused. I think we need to – in fact, you shouldn't, you shouldn't name viruses anymore based on what they infect, right? Now, the adenoviruses, right, were named because they were first isolated from adenoids, right? 
but they clearly infect other places. Yeah, but neurotropic, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that name I'm away. I'm not from taking those neurotropic. Viruses. Yeah, well, that's an area of the body that viruses infect. That's just what you no, said. No, neurotropic is a property. It's, oh, not, well, it's not. It's not a uh, classification. Okay, name. so we should name them after the properties, then, just like that. Well, what would you call all these viruses that are lumped together as yeah, an enterovirus exactly, now? Exactly. Exactly. That would be know. my question, not an answer. I well, I haven't come up. Maybe an acronym for the names, you know. Ah. Yeah, and we have we have the opposite problem with hepatitis viruses. You've got a whole bunch of viruses that are totally unrelated to each other that happen to cause the same endpoint clinically or similar endpoints clinically, and they all yeah. got called hepatitis. But hepatitis A and hepatitis B and hepatitis A, it's, you know, it's they're, different vi- they're very different viruses. So hepatotropic would be a better name than hepatic or hepatitis. Causing. Well, Hepa- uh, hepatotropic. Should we name them by their relationships among each other, or should we name them by their effect on us? This sounds like a virology uh, one-on-one relationships. question. <laughs> well, if you're going to use sequence, that's relationships then. So you should name it on that. But, you know, we, we, we're stuck with this historical baggage, and it's, it's very hard to change. So I think we're stuck with enterovirus. But um, I, I, if you come up with a better name, let's hear it. Maybe we should have a contest, and then we'll send well, the best one to ICTV. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with respiratory? I mean, I- I you think that's a good Dixon, thing. Dixon, I'm asking you. You're not listening to me. I am what listening What do you call poliovirus, you. coxsackie, rhino, viruses that infect either the respiratory or the GI tract? Well, then they're mixed. You want to call them mixed viruses? They have two. They have two functions, but most of them don't. Most of them just have a single Doesn't function. matter. Rhinoviruses are all thrown in there with polio. Yeah, well, I don't like that either, any more than you so do. Can, do you right, have they're, all, they're all within the picornaviruses, and unfortunately that name is already taken for the larger group, Brent. Sure. So, so underneath Picorna, you have respiratory, entero, mixed. You have you have these different categories. Kathy, what should we call them? <laughs> you can do some kind of blend, like yeah. rentero or yeah, rest, rentero, res, rentero, rentero, or respentero. Well, that's I think they ought to be called <laughs> Vinny virus. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 not Vinny, because I had nothing to do with them. Vincotropic, <laughs> Vincotropic. Uh, but someone will come out. I didn't think very carefully, but I think we need a new name, but that's going to be hard to do. But maybe we could send some of these confusing emails into ICTV and say, hey, you have to change this. People don't understand. Yeah. So that's Entero 68. So now, and, and, and with that, I think we should move on to some email. What do you think? <laughs> sure. Yeah, we've yeah. only got another two hours to go. No, no, we, <laughs> Kathy has to leave in 15 minutes. That's true. So we can do a few and get her pick. Okay. Um, All right, let me read this email from Dallas. Dear Twivers, I think this is a terrific email. They're all terrific, but this, for me, this is very terrific, if I can say very terrific. (laughs) Your comments on Twiv 294 on the formation of the Cambridge Working Group is probably highly understating the risk to basic research posed by their activities. As our scientific understanding of the world continues to increase, the real complexity becomes more apparent and individuals, including the best scientists, only have fractional knowledge in smaller and smaller subdomains of all human knowledge. The days of Renaissance man are long past. This means that even very brilliant people like yourselves, who I hold in awe for the depth and breadth of your knowledge, will make errors in comments outside your range of expertise. Under these conditions of individual information knowledge limits, it becomes very easy for someone with chicken little, the sky is falling type thinking to get great traction using simplified pseudoscientific vocabulary that can only be contradicted by getting into the technical weeds way beyond the understanding of most people. I am afraid that the Cambridge Working Group is just the innocent sounding start of what we have seen evolved to ultimately kill research and innovation in other areas. At the present time, they are somewhat reasonable scientists, but once funded and staffed organizations, rules, policies, agencies with bureaucrats and lawyers obtain power over approvals, permits, and grants, there will be an evolution towards zero risk by saying no to everything that has any risk of finding out anything new, especially something unexpected. A bureaucrat who approves an experiment that turns out bad, even with trivial impact, will be faulted. But if he just asks more questions and delays for a decade or two, he has a career and retirement. (laughs) Every imaginary could, can, may, and concern of an active imagination, no matter how improbable, becomes an unacceptable risk. For a lesson in this type of evolution, one could look at nuclear energy or areas like climate change, where opposing activists have obtained significant control over policy and research. For anyone outside the specific technical areas, they don't have enough basic knowledge to rationally evaluate the science. 
as most of the TWIV group probably already believe the science of CO2 and climate change and discount the beliefs of the deniers, I will use nuclear energy as an example of organizational social evolution leading to ultimately research starvation and detrimental outcomes for society. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was fantastic progress in both science and applications of nuclear energy being made along with some mistakes. As it was easy to create a truly catastrophic image, sloppy science by people like Ernest Sternglass with claims of weapons testing causing infant mortality using cherry-picked data sets and excluding known relevant parameters were able to achieve great political traction published in science. That and other scientific concerns was combined with an excellent movie, China Syndrome, with Jane Fonda, followed by the Three Mile Island accident. This recast Fonda as a real expert in nuclear power, providing testimony to Congress about the huge unacceptable risks. After that, forget any new power plants or research as the labs at major universities closed and the reactors decommissioned. Now that close half a century has passed, we can ask how accurate the risk analysis and hyperbolic claims were and what were the unseen and unpredicted consequences of those decisions. In the U.S., the actual impact of Three Mile Island was a billiard-dollar class cleanup, and even when you add in Chernobyl, a thermally unstable design, with about 4,000 or so mortalities in Fukushima, 20,000 killed by tsunami, zero by radiation, the cost of humanity of the alternative power supply of coal and oil makes those numbers mm -hmm. look trivial. The blocking of nuclear power increased oil and coal use with, with very dispersed but far more deadly impacts to much larger numbers of people, 24,000 per year in the U.S., WHO. Virology experiments such as gain of function or any modification of viral genes put all virology in the political target zone. You can hypothesize all sorts of sky is falling scenarios. You have almost all the conditions for a Cambridge working group to evolve into a movement to stop the crazy scientists with their BSL-4 labs who will destroy humanity. The researcher will counter with regulations, policies, and procedures, but the activists will want independent regulators and a place at the table and lifetime income that comes with that to review all proposed research. Once the opposition to this dangerous research congeals into a movement with cash and a staff, some research article showing a lab-modified gene and some virus causing a health problem, and the research will be effectively shut down. Even when the article is proven false and retracted, the impact will stay and research will be destroyed. Note that after a half a century of medical progress and natural exposure variations of factors 10 to 100, our knowledge about the impacts of low levels of radiation hasn't significantly improved. Money is being spent, but progress is stalled. If you think as I do, we don't have enough low-direction research for pure exploration, wait until you have non-expert risk managers sitting on grant review committees. Mm -hmm. These regulatory systems formally driven by the precautionary principle evolve into doing nothing with anything that has any possible or even imaginary risk. The applicant would then have to prove the concern isn't real, but that is proving a negative that can't be done without the experiment being completed. Good luck in preventing an anti-biotechnology virology activism from effectively killing creative research along with the use of BSL-4 facilities anywhere near anything or anybody. <laughs> Great letter. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and there's, a, there's a PS that I won't add where he gives a specific example about what happened in his area, which is aquaculture. All right. Rich Condit. I'm reading a letter. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. Richard writes, Dear Twivers, hello from Sedona, Arizona. It's That's peaked nice out at 102, today, uh, 102 Fahrenheit today with very clear skies and a little wind. But as we Arizonans say, it's okay because the humidity is low, 11%. <laughs> I'm sorry, 102 is 102. <laughs> However, it should be pointed out that we have had an in, uh, increasingly hot summers over the many years my wife and I have had the great privilege of living in this beautiful place. Yes, yeah, Sedona is awesome. At least from the perspective of this little corner of the world, there is no doubt about climate change. For a few months, I fell behind on TWIP, but now I'm catching up. I have comments on two podcasts from a few months ago. First, I would like to nominate TWIV 275, Virocentricity, with Eugene Coonan for introduction into the TWIV Hall of Fame. Do we have a TWIV Hall of Fame? Now we do. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Induction into the TWIV Hall of Fame. I believe it is certainly amongst the most elegant, provocative, humane, and visionary TWIVs. Wow. I have listened to it twice and am now reading Coonan's recent papers. They are stunning in their brilliance. Coonan's ideas are of great importance to all biological science and perhaps even more broadly. Vincent's and Rich's interview of Coonan was superbly done. Thank you. Thank you. I have two mm -hmm. questions. You brought out the 
differences between the views of Kunin and of Clavery and Abergel, but you didn't express your own views. Mm. Big to small or small to big? What do you think? Also, did viruses precede cells in the evolution of life? What do you think? Okay, so I'm going to pause there. What he's talking about is this, uh, these two uh, different hypotheses that have been formulated to describe the origin or evolution of the large cytoplasmic DNA viruses, in particular the giant viruses. Uh, and a, a lot of this revolves around the fact that some of these giant viruses contain uh, cellular or homologs of cellular genes involved in, in particular, protein synthesis, uh, translation genes. And it has been uh, hypothesized by Clavery and Abergel that this uh, means that these viruses actually were derived from cells and have were uh, and have carried these genes along with them and have become viruses among other things by spitting out the cellular genes that they uh, started with and are reduced in size and uh, 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 this involves that the, uh, the ancestor for these viruses, uh, therefore, can't, uh, uh, because of the phylogenetics that they uh, have done, can't be identified. So the idea is that there was a fourth domain of life now extinct from which these viruses came. And I think we discussed that paper some, some time ago on TWIB. Uh, the opposing theory uh, uh, from Kunin is that, in fact, these viruses started out from a common smaller ancestor and got bigger and acquired uh, cellular genes at one point or another for these various processes. And uh, uh, if you want my opinion, I'm with Eugene. And he's recently published a paper in virology called Origin of Giant Viruses from Smaller DNA Viruses Not from a Fourth Domain of Cellular Life, where he goes into this in detail and does a rigorous phylogenetic al analysis. And this is his bag, after all, um, showing uh, that the, uh, they arrived... Uh, are derived from a common ancestor and that the cellular genes are homologous to uh, existing uh, phylogenetically to uh, cellular genes from existing species not a or existing uh, yeah species not a fourth domain of life and he does it uh, very very nicely and that article is open access Second, TWIV 277, my podcast. Oh, he also wanted to know, do viruses precede cells in the evolution of life? Uh, I, once again, like Kunin's paper where I don't know if it precedes cells. And in fact, Eugene uh, was uh, evasive on that, as I recall. He says, I don't know. But he does say, <laughs> uh, I think he does say that, you know, it's apparent that they go back to the very earliest uh, uh, of times, almost as if there's a co-evolution from the beginning. But, um, uh, well, actually, I, I think he would say that probably all the re replication mechanisms existed in the primordial soup. Right. Right. And then right. Uh, DNA, for various reasons, became the cellularized uh, genome. So by that description, viruses, or at least the replicating nucleic acids by all those different uh, mechanisms would precede cellular life. Yeah. And, you know, whatever Gene says is fine with me because uh, <laughs> the guy has really thought it out and he's really eloquent on the topic. And I love the papers that describe that. Second, TWIV 277, my podcast, Vinny, was tremendously enjoyable and it is very good that Vincent agreed to the uh, interview. You are to be congratulated for the discussion of condoms and their quality testing. Condoms represent one of the most important technologies for public health today. They allow millions of couples to help determine the number and spacing of children. They help millions more protect themselves from infectious viral diseases such as HPV, HBV, HIV, and other sexually transmitted diseases. The assurance of their quality is an essential step in their production, as with any human health technology. While condom testing may evoke certain smile-provoking images, the testing of these uh, products in accordance to high standards is an important undertaking. One of the important contributions of 
uh, PATH, a nonprofit biotechnology organization based in Seattle, where I worked for many years, was to develop improved mm -hmm. methods for condom testing uh, that helped reduce condom failure and thus unwarranted pregnancies and disease transmission. Thanks for bringing up this important topic on TWIV. TWIV has become an important medium for science communication worldwide, and you are all to be congratulated for your tremendous contributions. All the best. That's from Rich. Did Thank you did you write that? I did not. I could not write that well. So, good. Uh, Kathy, let's do your pick because you have to go. Are you there? She's uh oh, not. she's not. She's gone. Sorry, I had my microphone Whoops. muted. Whoops. Um, Whoops. Because I was probably coughing. Um, <laughs> no, but so, don't we do um, your pick. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I want to do my pick and. Uh, it's one of the ones in the series of uh, looking at things in uh, 3D. So uh, somebody has taken an industrial sander and combined <laughs> that with time-lapse uh, video, and they look at logs and uh, several other different things. It's, it's really pretty cool. They <laughs> kind of do all the slices all the way through, and then they come back out. So, uh, so it cool. makes it about twice as long as it uh, yeah, uh, might be. But they do a camera and a walnut. And uh, just, it's, uh, it's not very long, but it's fun to watch. I wish they would have done, a, they should have done a stump. Yeah. <laughs> yes, stump that would have been perfect. <laughs> Literally. Yes. All right. Thanks very much, Kathy. Right. Okay. Thanks. See you. Yep. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Kathy. Bye. Bye-bye. I just wanted to say um, <clears throat> two things. Dallas's letter, I I. I completely agree with his overall sentiment. I think that we're going down a road of regulation that I'm afraid is going to stifle uh, innovation in science, and I, I just hope it doesn't go there. And I think he said it better than than I could ever say. Um, and as far as um, Richard's email concerns, so what what do I believe? So I think that replicating nucleic acids existed before cells, and you could consider those viruses. I think cells probably evolved from them. Um, and then they probably, uh, so those cells gave rise to some viruses. But I think also viruses continued to evolve and acquired cellular genes. So I think big, small, small, big, I think both could have probably happened uh, as well. And, you know, the, Kunin has his view, but I don't think there's a fourth domain of life, by the way. But the other groups have different views, and they, they get together at meetings and they argue with one another. It's quite interesting mm -hmm. to listen to them, but that would be my view on that. All right, let's get back to picks. And I know that Dixon actually has a pick today. And it's actually, the link is even in the show notes. How did that happen? Well, I didn't put it there. An aberration has occurred. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. I, Dixon, I you did. Oh, that's the thing. I did. I you did. guys. Sorry. By the way, I wanted to comment on that one last uh, re read by uh, Rich also. I, I stopped uh, listening to that podcast very soon afterwards thinking it was condom, uh, not condom. So, you know, I have to go back and listen to the whole thing now. <laughs> <laughs> You're a funny guy. Ha, 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 ha. Just. Whoa. Just, oh, well. Yeah, so I was. That's my pick, but I had another pick, which I thought was even better. Jeff Dixon, can you tell us what your pick is? Uh, yes, <laughs> it is a series of absolutely stunning uh, stills of a lava-based volcanic eruption in Iceland that is ongoing as we speak. But the pictures are, you know, you've seen Kilauea and all the images from that volcano in Hawaii, and I've never seen anything quite like these. Um, Images of the Earth bubbling up out of the magma below the uh, crust. Yeah, this is amazing. I got to send this. These are great up. photos. They're remarkable photographs. They're just stunning in every aspect. So another visual pick from yours truly. Very but, good. But I had another one which I could throw in just as an add-in, <clears throat> and that was an article that I read in, in, of all places, Science Magazine, of autonomous, uh, self-programming robots which form patterns reminiscent of those that are formed in nature by schooling fish and uh, flocks of birds and things. We've always been amazed at how coordinated that all looks, you know, to an outside viewer. When big, gigantic numbers of birds uh, fly by and you can see one turns and the rest of them all seem to turn in the same way, how does that work? So someone has cleverly designed a thousand of these little programmable robotic devices and then 
they have these patterns like a letter K or a circle or a funny face or a guy jumping up and down on the left. And then they, they teach these little robots all randomly moving around, but they're following some instruction that eventually forms that letter or that pattern in a very short period of time. The, the, the mass of robotic little devices seem to teach each other and to learn and then to express. So it was a rather complicated math that, that, that uh, was involved in explaining this phenomenon, but the actual achievement of the, uh, the, the goal to get these uh, thousand little steel robots to form little associations and to make a figure just like a school of fish or a flock of birds was quite quite impressive. Gonna send a, a link I will. I'll it. send you the link to it. I, I, it was quite impressive. Thank quite you, impressive. Thank you, Dixon. You're Alan, welcome. what do you have? You're welcome. I have a website that's not much to look at, but uh, if you ever need to refer to it, it's it's quite organized. This is an index to creationist claims. <laughs> <clears throat> so, somebody has done the the difficult and thankless and apparently ongoing task of categorizing all of the claims made by uh, what they what they describe as the folklore of creationism mm-hmm. and this is this is uh, um, American evangelical uh, creationism uh, branch the the type that seems to be most uh, influential in screwing up science textbooks um, and they've they've categorized everything very nicely and explain why all this stuff is wrong, um, point by point. And it appears to be continuously updated. And it looks like somebody's been working on this for quite a while. It's nice. uh, since, since two thousand six, and they're and they're still <laughs> updating as as creationists continue to um, evolve. If you'll evolved. pardon the term, that's right. Because um, they do continue to make new arguments as the as the. But very handy, you know. So somebody comes at you with uh, some <laughs> some thing. All you got to do is give them this link. Yeah, there you so go. go look yeah, it and up. They do. All. They do have a little section on other creationism. So there's there's some stuff about Vedic and Native North American and Islamic oh. creationism, which have been less influential here. But uh, if you need those, it's in there. Nice. Love very it. Cool. Very cool. That's a lot Claim of number, and it's all it's all uh, done in a very highly organized fashion, like a taxonomy. Yeah. Human and dinosaur uh, claim CC one hundred and one. Human and dinosaur <laughs> footprints have been found together in Cretaceous rocks of the Paluxy Ritherbed, uh, Ritherbed near Glen Rose, Texas. He's got a source, a response, links, references, further reading. Holy cow! <laughs> that's amazing that's great yeah that's great i love it it's gorgeous a lot of work yeah rich what do you have well my uh grandkids visited recently <laughs> and i always when my grandkids are visiting uh learn about children's shows ah. um and uh, <laughs> uh uh their parents <clears throat> uh had them watching this PBS kids show called Wild Kratts. I'm, I, I should have picked this about two years ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's phenomenal. It's these two brothers. Uh, what are their names? I forget. Chris and Martin Kratt. Okay. <laughs> Who uh, are basically kind of naturalists. Uh, and they've, uh, they've put together this uh, cartoon show that's basically a nature show uh, that in any given episode, explores a one particular animal and starts out with them, you know, not huh. cartoon, uh, looking at the animal and stuff. And then they've got this cartoon theme where they can kind of get down and look at the whole uh, lifestyle of the animal and everything else. And it's just enormously well done. And I can't believe the energy these guys have. And the kids love it. I'm you know, they're sure. just they're glued to it. This is actually an outgrowth of a previous show these guys did that's probably still available on demand, at least it was when my daughter was this age, um, called Krat Brothers, which was, it was not a cartoon, it was a, an entirely live action um, mm-hmm. sort of uh, wildlife documentary thing, but How this funny. is a, a development of that. It is a really excellent show. I think these guys really need to be congratulated. We get a lot of... Uh, we get a lot of uh, email from people wondering, you know, what's our sci- uh, resources there are for teaching science to kids, and I think this is a great resource. Yeah, fabulous. Well, I also have a game. I haven't played it, but it looks cool. It's, yeah. called, it's called Immune Quest. I was going to pick this one actually. It was in my <laughs> list. Really? Yeah, <laughs> and and I will warn you that the Mac version is very very glitchy. 
Oh, okay. Oh, so okay. they need to work on it a little bit. Well, I'm going to just link to their YouTube channel where they have a trailer showing the game, and then they have another video called Opsonization, <laughs> which I thought was great. So uh, check that out, and if anyone has played it. Uh, have you played it, Alan? You have? I, I tried to. I downloaded the game, yeah. um, and I, I got started on it, and I was... Uh, uh, I was a macrophage, and then I, I, <laughs> I, I you know, I, I cleaned up the initial mess, and then I tried to to move to the next thing. I was still on the tutorial level, and it just it, it kept it would zoom the screen in all sorts of different mm. ways. It, it may be because I have the um, the Apple uh, trackpad thing yeah. on my desktop machine, but well, whatever it was, it it just um, Alan, yeah. maybe you're just the wrong somewhere. idiot type. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, I like science-based games. It seemed like a cool one. It, I, oh yeah, it looks like a great idea, and it is. From what I did see of it, it's it's well executed. Uh, listener pick is from Kay, who writes: A few weeks ago, you picked the book "Viral Entry into Host Cells," which at that time was downloadable for free from the Springer website. As you will have noticed, they now charge one hundred forty-nine dollars. Oh. However, there is another interesting option to get this book for free. <laughs> it's, part <Steal> of the, <clears throat> it's part of the Landis Bioscience Open Access Collection. Actually, Landis and Springer are both listed as publishers, and she gives a link to that. Okay. I browsed the list of books in the Open Access Collection and found several interesting titles with relevance for virology and microbiology. Unless it's been picked before, this collection would probably make a good pick in its own right. And she gives a link to that. Thank you. Thanks for the great show. Super. Best wishes, Kay, who is at the Institute for Genetics in Cologne. Which Dixon is in Germany. Indeed it is. Yeah. And that will do it for TWIV 302. Wow, we're into the next 100. Nice. Yeah. You can find this episode in all previous 301. <laughs> That's a nice catalog, isn't it? So for 400, <clears throat> we should get all of us together at a BSL-4 facility with a Nobel laureate, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. If, if there are any BSL-4s left. If I can unhook my IV, I'll be there. <laughs> well, Dixon, it's only two years from now. Yeah, well, that's true, that's true, that's true. All these episodes are for free at twiv.tv, also on iTunes, and we do like, like getting your questions and comments. We are quite far behind, but we'll get to them at some point, maybe by episode 400. We should do an all-email <laughs> show sometime. We should. Bingo. Bingo. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. <laughs> Kathy Spindler has left us, but she's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Bye, everybody. This was fun. <laughs> Rich, Condit's sorry, at sorry, the, Rich Condit's at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Uh, sure thing. It's a great fun. This is great fun. And we will miss you for the next six weeks or so. Uh, yes. You will, and I will miss you. I'm sorry. Maybe, miss, maybe there's yeah. I can find a way to drop in, but really, I'm going to be okay. out of action. I'll try and see if, we can, if I can make out it. Out of action. Maybe I can get down to Baltimore for... The day I'll, that'd be good. I'll, I'll that'd follow, be good. Follow up on that. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Dixon De Pommier is at verticalfarm.com. Yep. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. You were just in Nottingham, right? I was. Great meeting. It was fabulous. Vertical farming. Yep. Or urban oh, agriculture. Both. Nice. Both. 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 Over two hundred participants. Uh, lots of commercial interest, lots of commercial examples. Now, mm. So last year we had a, a meeting that only 60 people showed up. This year we had a meeting 200 people showed up. Nice. So, and you're like the godfather of this, the whole thing, right? Something like that, yeah. I guess and you're, so. you're wealthy as a consequence. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I'm not going to be here for the next six weeks. No, that's not true. <laughs> I'll be here. Thank you, Dixon. Wild horses couldn't keep me away. Who did that song? The Stones. Mm-hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.